Welcome to the show, Matt Barry. We are super excited to have a chat to you today. You've built one of the biggest tech companies in the world. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Welcome, Matt. And mate, congratulations on the share price. It's doubled in the past six months. Oh, it's a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, congratulations on 51 million users. Well, I guess, yeah, 51 million people on the platform and also 20 million jobs. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, I think we're actually higher than that now, actually. I'm just checking. 54 million. On the wow, platform 54 now. that's incredible. million people. That's yeah. insane. Did you have to be like one of the biggest employees in the world? Well, there's a lot of people. Um, <laughs> that's a huge amount of people. So, I mean, if you need anything done, I mean, there's nowhere else <laughs> in the world that has the liquidity we have in terms of the breadth and depth of skills and the, the immediacy in which you can find someone. So, Is it true that NASA is actually using your platform? Uh, they are. They've been using it since 2015. That's uh, incredible. In fact... We've just, uh, there's, there's, there's been a lot of work. I mean, it all started uh, a long time ago where, you know, they just randomly started posting projects in the platform. And in fact, the first one was for training the image recognition system of the Robonaut R2 robotic astronaut on the space station, which looks like a Terminator sort of thing. And they uh, were putting new legs on this robot at the time wow. to allow it to do um, spacewalks. And so it needed to train the um, image recognition system to be able to um, manipulate things. So uh, the initial project, uh, a series of projects or contests were to um, develop 3D models uh, for things that it interacts with, um, such as um, you know, tools, flashlights, um, access uh, hatches, uh, and so forth. And the first one was actually for, for the handrails on the space station. And so they put a contest in. And um, it was incredibly successful. In fact, the next day I got an email back from, from the, um, the mission director saying, well, let me tell you the old way we did things. The old way, if we wanted to get 3D models developed, was we would uh, write up a job description for a full-time job, we would pay probably $200,000 a year for a 3D model designer in, uh, I think it was around Moffat um, Airfield in, in California. We would have to then uh, circulate internally for about four weeks because we're a government organization. We would then have to um, uh, post it externally. We would start our job interviews, which should take a series of weeks. We would select our candidate. We would then um, make a job offer. Um, there's two weeks notice period in the US. We'd wait for them to start work. We'd get them an office, a computer, an access card, uh, you know, security access and so forth. And they'll start work a, a period of time afterwards and then that would become productive. And your website put $50 in. <laughs> Overnight, I got uh, you know, 95 designs, whatever the number was. Um, they were photorealistic 3D models, uh, which were developed from um, photographs that we provided. And I think you made $5. Huh. Uh, and this, he actually said, quote, I've got an email from, from NASA saying, this, this is the crack that will feed my crack addiction. Since that point in time, they've hired, um, there's been over 13,000 product designs submitted by about six or 7,000 freelancers. Uh, last year, our relationship with NASA deepened, and we've been doing things like um, everything from, from that 3D modeling through to we designed a robotic arm, including the electronics uh, and actuators and so forth for a, um, a cuboid um, a, a robot on the space station that blows itself around using uh, compressed air uh, called the Astro B. Uh, we designed an arm for, for, for that. We designed a uh, heads-up display for the astronauts, and they do their deep um, underwater uh, sort of training um, for basically spacewalks. Uh, we even got origami experts globally together to design um, ways to efficiently pack heat shielding for deep space missions. And then more recently, uh, last year, we, we jointly won a, um, a tender with NASA, um, which is $25 million US dollar tender wow. with, with 19 other companies, but we're, we're the biggest, um, uh, for uh, working with our agencies across the US, not, and, uh, including NASA. So with the uh, U.S. Bureau of Reclam Reclamation, which is the Hydroelectric Power Authority through NASA, we um, are now doing very large contests. They're so not $50 contests. We're doing many hundreds of thousands of dollar contests. In fact, we've got one that's active now. If any uh, electrical engineers or power engineers are listening to your to your podcast, um, this is for efficient ways of uh, ensuring you can test hydroelectric power generation without turning the, uh, the whole system off when you're doing testing. That's live on our website now, freelancer.com slash NASA, and uh, there's there's about 200,000 US dollars of prize money there. Uh, we also have won a data science challenge through them with the National Institute of Health for uh, lowering child morbidity, um, uh, looking at data. So any data scientists are interested to sign up for that. Uh, again, with the US Bureau of Reclamation, we've got a, a project that's going live, contest going live for uh, computational fluid dynamics for um, river um, hydraulic modeling and sedimentation modeling. Um, and that involves around um, optimizing sort of sparse 
um, uh, matrices. Uh, so any mathematicians uh, there, or comp computer scientists, got a big prize there for a couple hundred grand. And then uh, we've actually got uh, a couple more. We've just won with the US Department of Commerce and actually with NASA's, um, I think it's called Space Command. So uh, in the fields of uh, information security and also uh, in um, software development. So there's some, some pretty, pretty cool stuff happening with NASA and our relationship continues to expand. Well, I feel a little, a little underwhelmed. I used freelancer recently for some data entry work. <laughs> <laughs> well, we make some of that. I mean, I don't know what can get data entry done so, so efficiently. It's actually so. interesting because, you know, when you're talking about the work that you're doing and, and the freelancers are doing, I love that you use the word we. So it's like you're mm -hmm. actually, you've created a platform where you are literally contributing to sending people to space and I'm sure doing a million other amazing things. How do you um, keep your community engaged? Because obviously it's like a two-sided platform. So you've got yeah. your freelancers and then you've got the people who are posting jobs. So mm -hmm. is there a different strategy for both? And can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, in, in, in some ways, I mean, because we're the largest platform in the world, we just attract a lot of people. I'm on, on the supply side, so the, the, the talent, I mean, we're acquiring, I think, now 25 to 40,000 new users a day. So uh, wow. you, you, you name it. I mean, the, the, the closest marketplace to us is about one-tenth the number of users. Wow. Uh, probably probably even smaller. So we have everyone and um, over 2,000 skill sets. So in, uh, from that perspective, we don't really need to do, do, need to do much. I mean, people just find us on the internet and sign up and bid on jobs. And the great thing is if you're a service provider and no matter where you are in the world now, you can get access to jobs in technical fields that might not otherwise be available. I mean, if you're in you know, rural Australia, for example, the only thing in your area might be a mine. If you might be in rural India, it might be a, a textile mill or it might be a um, forestry uh, uh, you know, organization in, in Europe. And now you can go online, you can work in technical jobs, white collar jobs, software development and you know, design and um, data science. And no matter what the skill set is, we have the, we have the jobs, and you, we actually bring the jobs to you. So uh, rather than you have to go run around and try and uh, chase work, that the jobs are listed. You basically tune your filters, and and um, they kind of come to you. Um, and as you kind of work up the, the ranks and you get your experience and your expertise and build your reputation up, uh, you know your ability to win gets easier and easier and easier. I mean, the first job you win will be the hardest. You've got, you're unranked. You've got to fill out your portfolio and your description and so forth. And you know, um, you know, basically, it, it you know really engaged. And that, that hard the first job is really really hard to win. Um, but as as you kind of win jobs, it gets easier and easier. On the client side, we scale our brief. We're from consumer up to up to the largest organizations in the world. So you know, you can get a job done as easily as ten dollars. Something as simple as like help me debug my website. I've got a few, it's not loading properly, or or uh, design for me a logo. And and let me tell you, if you've never used the site before and you want to have your mind kind of exploded, just just go on and post a contest and get a logo done for ten dollars or a business card done for ten dollars and just see what happens. And uh, trust me, you'll you just go. Jesus Christ, <laughs> it's, 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 it's phenomenal um, what happens. Um, I, won't, I, won't, I won't give away the, uh, the, the, what actually happens, but go and try it. Um, and it's free to post your project. It's you know, very, very inexpensive to use the site. And as you can see, we can scale up from very, very um, simple jobs right up to very sophisticated jobs. Some of the things I talked about were, you know, at the, at the, you know, the you know, require advanced degrees in engineering or science or whatever it may be. So if there's a job, you know, that you have, whether it's a, a local job or it's an online job, whether it's a technical job or something that's unskilled, we can we can do it. And um, and we now scale up to large enterprises, so Fortune 500 globally. For example, with US Consulting and Deloitte, uh, we've built a system called MyGeeks, which is a version of Freelance, which is deployed internally. Mm -hmm. uh, they've loaded about 25,000 consultants onto it. It's going to 52,000 before it's going to go to the next step, which is multiples higher than that, and basically allows Deloitte consultants to hire other Deloitte consultants if they click the left button or if they click the right button, it goes to the cloud and uh, access basically all the freelancers and all different skill sets. And yeah, we're doing um, yeah, amazing things there. We're working with organizations like you know, Airbus. You know, um, we, we find freelancers to find more efficient ways to um, optimize their um, manufacturing line for the helicopters. Um, you know, uh, we work working with you know, one of the largest computer companies in the world to um, rejig their supply chain. So instead, when you break your computer or your um, or your or your printer, uh, instead of one of their field technicians going out to repair your computer or printer, it's one of our freelancers who's been trained who goes out maybe on a scooter. Uh, you know, we've got that live in in Indonesia. It's now going national in India. Where it's going it's going live in Australia as we speak. It's been delayed by the lockdowns, but that should go live in Victoria any day now, and uh, then hopefully 13 other countries after that. And uh, so from very simple to very complex and very complex at scale and sophistication. 
Freelance is obviously one of the biggest marketplaces in the world. What's what's next for freelance? If you're the biggest, what's well, still you can still add zeros to everything that we do. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there are five billion people or so on the internet, yeah. um, and there are only fifty million on our website, right? So there's still a couple of zeros to be added. Um, if you think about intuitively, um, you know, about the number of people on Facebook, for example. I mean, you, you're either in two camps. You're either, you know, you either uh, need a better job and 5 billion people on the planet earn $30 a day or less US. And so there are 5 billion people that actually need a better job. Um, and using the internet now, you can access a world of jobs, sophisticated jobs, uh, white collar jobs uh, uh, around the world. Uh, and, or you need something done. Uh, and with the job starting at $10 and it's going up to Fortune 500, you can get anything done, right? So you kind of, as long as you can, as long as you can access a computer and, and, and uh, <laughs> Yeah, you either want a job or you you wanted someone to help you. And I think in the future, I mean, it's not just enterprises that will have some percentage of their workforce from the cloud. And I think universally, Fortune 100 have, have been bitten off that um, in, in, from their own research that you know in the future, some percentage of the workforce will come from the cloud. They're not sure if it's five percent, ten percent, fifteen percent, or twenty five percent. That's kind of the range they're thinking. And I'm not sure if it's one year, three years, five years, or ten years away. But that's the range they're thinking. And so with COVID, everything's accelerated because everyone's working at home, working online. You know, last March, 94% of the world's workforce was su subject to um, some sort of um, uh, uh, work at home provisions. You know, the same thing's gonna happen with, with, with consumers, right? You'll have a person area network, and some people already have this, where you have on demand, a designer, on demand, a programmer, on demand, a researcher, on demand, a data entry person, and uh, you only pay as you use them, right? So you'll never fire anyone. If you find someone great, you don't fire them because you only pay them when, as you use them. You know, it's, a, it's a, one of the biggest transformations of the workforce I think ever. Yeah, it's actually it's interesting. Right I feel like the um, the whole gig economy and even the open marketplace um, concept has really transformed so many industries. Like I look at Uber, obviously um, freelancer, uh, and I think the air tasker. Know, yeah, air tasker. So I think more and more of these open marketplace type businesses are starting up. So if Say, for example, you had the chance to talk to a, a group of students and they were looking to start their own online marketplace. What advice would you give them? Because I think that I think more and more businesses uh, or business models would be adopting this method, but there's so many little, you know, pitfalls or pit, uh, pit holes? I can't even think of the thing. Um, you know, potential... Pitfalls. Yeah, pitfalls. Right. <laughs> pit holes, that's definitely not it. Pitfalls that, you know, you could potentially avoid. Well, f I mean, first of all, you need to um, build a marketplace in a... In a in a segment that's that's large, right? Um, you're taking a commission of the gross payment volume through the marketplace, so you need to have a large market segment. Um, there's a lot of marketplaces starting up that are in very, very, very tiny segments, um, and at the end of the day, you can't really build a, a viable business model out of them. You know, an, e an easy thing to do is kind of what people are doing in the in product side uh, for, for a while, which is pick the eyes out of um, Craigslist or eBay, find a segment that is big, uh, maybe watches or you know, what have you, and kind of try and do it yourself. Uh, although I won't say watches because we're actually doing the payments for <laughs> eBay watches with escrow.com. But, uh, you know, that's what traditionally people have done. It's, it's harder to do in services because services is lag products um, uh, substantially. I mean, the, some of the largest companies in the world by market capitalization are global marketplaces of products, you know, Amazon's, eBay's, Alibaba's, and so forth. Um, services will get there. In fact, the services space is bigger than the, the product space, but it's, it's lagged by about 20 years. Um, wow. Yeah, in 1994 was the year that geeks had email addresses. 1995 was the year your grandmother had an email address. As people went online, you know, very consumer-driven economies in the West, US, UK, Canada, Australia, et cetera, that was the kind of year that the internet really took off. It led to the emergence of global, global marketplaces of products in emerging markets you know people don't have many possessions to sell and much money to buy so the way they're transacting is through services the, the issue is that um, services are much more complex to deliver over the internet you know if you're selling a book a book's a book you can tell whether it's counterfeit or not <laughs> you know it's for the most part um, and it, it you know the book's not a sentient being you know if you're selling services over the internet um, you know you like it you know, your, technical, your CTO hates it, says the technology stack's no good. You know, your, your girlfriend says it's great, looks beautiful. The marketing person says it looks looks great. You know, someone else hates it. It's, it's, it's very subjective and it's very complicated um, and, and takes a long time. Um, the other thing is that the, that the services um, supplier side only really came on line on the internet uh, in the late 2000s, right? Uh, because, you know, in, in, in 1999, you know, there was no internet in emerging markets. Right, um, that only really came around with the BPO revolution in, in India that started off in the early 2000s, and then late late 2000s it was Southeast Asia and 
now everyone's connecting up, but um, it, it, it has has lagged. And plus, over time, you need to get human computer in interaction up. You need to get you know, software into the cloud. You had to get the tools out there. You had to get people trained up. You know, it's a very powerful force. If you can make your month's salary in a few hours, a few days, you know, uh, you know, it's a very powerful force to drive education and drive skills. And the great thing about the world today is all the world's human knowledge is online and available for you to access for free, for the most part. The certification is cost money. So when you get the, the certificate to say you've actually studied the material, it costs you, but everything else is free. So, um, you know, it is, it is, you know, a, a incredibly trans transformational for the world to, uh, and particularly in emerging markets where, you know, you know wages are going up rapidly in parts of, parts of the world. And it's markets like, marketplaces like ours that have enabled that. But, you know, back to your initial question of, you know, what would you do? You know, pick, pick a large market segment if you're thinking of starting a marketplace. Products are significantly easier than, than services. If you have competitors, you have to buy them all. Um, you know, it, it's simple as that. I mean, and typically, if you're smart and you move quickly, you can buy your competitors more more efficiently than paying Google AdWords and other paid marketing channels. Um, and if you if you're too late and too slow, you end up like a Groupon situation where you have competitors every market in the world because mm. everyone clones the hell out of you, mm. right? Um, you got to get that. You got to get scale quickly, and you got to get to be the biggest as fast as you can. Um, what else can I say uh, about services? Uh, uh, marketplaces, well, plenty, plenty more if I think about it in a second. I'll, I'll well, Matt, can we, um, bring it up. many of our listeners are actually startup founders. Can we t discuss your first one or two years launching Freelancer? I think it was back in 2007. And what, what challenges did you face in those years? Well, it's, uh, 2007, I kind of started on it because I stumbled across a website called Get a Freelancer that you know, looked like it was Craigslist. It looked terrible. Um, I uh, very short story because I'm the, the the problem is when you start a company and you, and you get like a decade in is everyone still asks you questions for how do you start the company and after a decade you kind of get sick of answering that question but I'll I'll say it really 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 quickly I I, I stumbled across a website could get a freelancer I was trying to get some data entry done filling in a spreadsheet with name of shops phone number addresses whatever a thousand rows I say I pay two dollars a row I pay two thousand dollars to fill the spreadsheet in it's really boring work I'll try to get a little friend. Um, friends, brother or sister do the job, but, you know, they kept on complaining, this job is boring. I go, yes, I know it's boring, otherwise I'll do it. That's why I'm paying you. It wasn't the sort of job you could actually go to a job board and post, really. It wasn't the place you could go like a seek or anything like that and post it. It's not a full-time job. Back then, you kind of posted these things in supermarket notice boards or university notice boards or what have you, uh, or maybe the local newspaper. It was kind of a difficult sort of thing to do, you know, get a project done. Um, if I told you back in 2007, did you know you get a website built by someone in Bangladesh for $50, the average person on the street would say, where's Bangladesh? Do, do people speak English? Do they do they have computers? You know, and it, the, the concept was completely foreign. Like 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, completely foreign. Like now it's obvious. You go to the internet, get hire someone. But, but it was amazing. Like uh, only about a little over 10 years ago, it was completely foreign. Basically, I stumbled across this website after frustration for many months. Um, I think I typed you know, data entry online or cheap data entry onto Google. I then posted a job. It cost me $5 back then. Now it's free. Um, I went to lunch, came back three hours later, and my inbox exploded. And I thought, what's going on? And it's like there's 74 or so emails saying I'll do the job. And I thought, there's no way this is real. I can't find one person to do it in Australia. This is ridiculous. This can't be real. And I went through and started emailing people, and they were applying. And I said, I pay 2000 The bids were 1500 400 300 200 $100. And I thought, why is someone bidding $100? My, bid, my, 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 my budget was 2000 And then, um, you know, I realized, obviously, the emerging markets. And it's, you know, it's stupid me. I grew up in Jakarta when I was a kid. So I should have, I should have realized. Um, but I just thought, this is incredible. I was going to pay $2,000. Couldn't find someone for four months. In hours, I found someone for $100. The job was done in like two or three days. It was perfect. I didn't have to pay for the job was done. I thought this is just game changing. I mm. thought this is just, I can get anything done now. Like, and, and as an entrepreneur, you know, at the time, kind of a little bit of a frustrated entrepreneur. My business, previous business sold to Intel eventually, but um, at the time I hadn't. And I'd kind of walked out of it as in semiconductor design. I just thought, this is incredible. I can build anything here. Like this is just an army of people. What, what should I build? And I thought I should, I should, I should build something. And I thought this is like a global marketplace of products. I thought, this is like eBay for jobs. Why hasn't eBay done this? I thought, and it was it just really just combobulating at the time because it's like, surely like there's global marketplaces of products. Surely there's going to be global marketplaces of services. Like this is just, can't, this can't be a massive category that everyone's missed. You know, and I did some research and there were, you know, hundreds of little companies trying to do something in the space, but no one set the world on fire. And I thought maybe I should build a business like this. So I actually used Get a Freelancer to copy Get a Freelancer. I, uh, did, I, did the, I, did, I did the programming and then I kind of hired designers and what have you. And after about two weeks, I had a rudimentary thing running and I kind of figured out what have you. And it turns out Get a Freelancer was a 
project on script lance which is another website and i actually ended up buying script lance and i <laughs> found the project that was posted to hire to build get a freelancer off script lance and i built it yeah, my version bitted out dot com off get a freelancer and anyway long story cut short but i ended up pretty much buying everything um <laughs> and merging it all together did you raise and money when I, you first launched only once okay and never for any operating capital i think i raised about uh, i think it was one and a half million dollars i forget now it's, like, it's 10 years i think i paid, paid about one and a half million by get get us to buy get a freelancer and that was it no other operating capital at all. Wow, that's incredible. Um, it was doing about a million in revenue at the time, 500,000 users, 5,000 biggest websites on the internet, and I optimized the hell out of it and um, got the revenue moving in a big way and, and took a public four years later, didn't raise a single cent more, and it opened at 1.1 billion US market cap. So that was a, probably one of the best returns in terms of equity investment in history, <laughs> um, turning one half million bucks into 1.1 billion in four years. Uh, so, yeah, it's yeah. incredible. So, so since then, I have, I have a philosophy of just of not raising money. I have a philosophy of actually just operating the business and you know, selling something, you know, raising money from the best place possible, which is selling something useful to customers. Mm. Um, and um, you know, since then, I've acquired escrow.com, which is a global payments business. It's done 5 billion US in payment volume. And I've also acquired a f two freight businesses, which are, um, which are phenomenal, which last year did 99 million kilometers of freight. Wow. Um, which is about 300 million of gross notional load value so we're in the broad fields now of labor payments and freight which are broad horizontal industries that support just about any business that's crazy can i ask you um like what gets you out of bed in the morning because i feel like you've obviously achieved a lot so like what keeps you going well it's interesting right it's exciting yeah <laughs> you know it's uh you know you're changing the world get to work with smart people and and you know go out there and you know build a big business it's it's uh, it's uh, exciting yeah. I was actually just going to ask you, because um, I've watched a couple of your interviews and I actually quite liked that you were, uh, you know, quite humble, like you were talking about your past failures and, you know, when you were thinking about starting a new project and, you know, you're like, oh, should I ask people? I failed before. They're going to take me seriously. Um, you know, and I think uh, that obviously hopefully comes with time, but, you know, we we really love mentors and we think that they're a really big part of you know, any sort of business success. Have you had any mentors in your life that have helped you? And, and if so, how? Yeah, I mean, a long time ago, before freelancer, I stopped bothering them. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, a bunch of them went through, you know, uh, you know anyone, anyone can hold the rudder when the sea is calm, right? And the rising tide lifts all boats, right? When the shit hits the fan, that's when you learn how to be a sailor, right? Um, yeah, no, I mean, in, in the early days, you know, um, some of the early businesses were, were challenging. Right, really challenging, and there were some great mentors that kind of helped me through, through that time. Um, and there were, you know, my, the last business before freelancer, you know, I had, to, God, I can't remember how many venture capitalists was in there. Were in there, it's, yeah, you know, I think maybe eight or something. I can't remember. And they were kind of fighting with each other or fighting with me. And I had a bunch of mentors that were kind of taking the flack and, you know, so forth. And, um, you know, it was just very, very painful. Um, and after, after after six years of running that business, I kind of thought I wouldn't bother them again. I'm good friends with them, but I'm not going to sit there and kind of, you know, uh, tap them for tap them for help all the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, like in the, light, in the journey of an entrepreneur, like it's like any anyone who's just has success and that's it. Uh, they don't know how to run a business, right? They they just know when things are going good. And you see this a lot in Silicon Valley because people come along and raise a hundred million dollars. And, you know, everything goes great. It's like, yeah, sure. But you, 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 you've been losing money every year. You know, you return, you know, you, you, you're doing maybe 20 million in revenue now, but you raised 200 million to get there. So it's capital destruction, right? And yeah, you, you're playing the great, find a greater full theory of venture investing, which is basically just dump everything you can into marketing and grow as fast as possible and hope you can sell to someone else, either in an IPO or a trade sale at some point. But you actually haven't figured out how to build a profitable business. You know, uh, in Australia, because the financing environment hasn't been great, although that's changed rapidly in the last number of years, we built great operators. Built people have bootstrapped their businesses. You know, uh, Rosalind Kogan at Kogan built bootstrapped his business. Yeah. Right, I was out there raising venture capital, Series A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, Mike and Scott Lassian didn't raise money until they got to a six hundred million valuation. Right, mm. they raised sixty million bucks. Right, that, but that was well down the path. Right, you know, the guys that build businesses in Australia, they want, they, they operate them. Right, and so they come out the other side. They can they can build global franchises. Right, um, world class businesses. Yeah, everyone get everyone gets punched, right? Everyone falls over. It's how fast you get back up again, right? Like you've 
you've got to go through some 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 disasters and train wrecks and some dark moments to get out the other side. Otherwise, you're, you're deluding yourself, right? That you're actually a good operator, right? Just you know, you've got to fail. It's usually about the third company before you actually start realizing, okay, I've stuffed up the first two. I've got to, I've learned, I've learned something. I've got to, you know, I won't, I won't, make, won't, won't make those mistakes again, right? And um, you know, when I hire U.S. executives. It's always very, very challenging. You look at these CVs and they're like, you know, from the years of, you know, 2013 to 2016, I was at Facebook and I did this and I did that, or I was at Twitter, or I was at Google, or I was at whatever. It's like, dude, you're 10 years down the tr- like, did, what did what did you do there? Like, like you know, if you were there in the early days, I'm sure you did something. But like, you know, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, you, you come look at these CVs and they're so impressive and they want such big packages and you go, what did you actually contribute? What do you actually do in these businesses, right? You want to get, you want to get the people to go through the growth phases where they make mistakes, they fall down, they get back up, they try things that don't work, they, they then try it, you know, et cetera, et cetera, so forth. I mean, I, I love hiring startup founders who have failed in the last company. And you know, I know people say this all the time, I love investing in you know, whatever people have failed. I don't think the VCs actually do like investing in people who have failed in companies that much, mm. to tell you the truth, because there is a bit of a stigma. Trust me, I know, you know for a long time, my last company before it sold, yeah, every meeting I went to for two years, it was just like, what happened to Sensory? What happened to Sensory? It literally drove me insane. It's almost insane as people ask me, how did you start Freelancer? Like, it's just, it's the same question over and over and over and over and over and over again, right? And you go crazy, crazy, right? But I do like hiring them um, as as employees. And I'll tell you why. One is because when the business goes a bit sideways, they try everything. Like, if your startup isn't working, you start trying everything, right? This works, that doesn't work. I've learned this, I've learned that. And then the number one question I ask people is like, what, what do you learn in hindsight? Like what? What do you learn about you know? Yeah, and, and in hindsight, what have you done? Dif- what would you do differently, right? And and see if they figured it out, right, in their heads of kind of how they would particularly grow a business. The other thing is the good thing about it is that they kind of get the startup bug out of their system, so it's not a case of you know six months later they go oh, I'm leaving to do a startup. I used to teach technology and entrepreneurship actually at, at, at university, and it was oh, um, well. I'd shoot myself in the foot every year because every time I teach it, <laughs> I'd lose twelve staff. <laughs> and I go, I'm taking your advice. I've been following your course online. I'm going to quit. <laughs> it's like it's like shit. I'm going to stop teaching this course every time I teach. Every time I teach, I lose people. So <laughs> uh, well, um, thank you so much. I, we're about to wrap up, unfortunately, because we know that you've got you know spaceships to build and things like that. So you're obviously very busy. But um, just to finish up, I'd love to know if there was one one thing that you could do differently on your freelancer journey, what would it be? Uh, do things quicker. <laughs> like, honestly, I mean, like, I, I wish I could. I feel yeah, like you're like, so quick already. <laughs> no, the one thing you don't have uh, an infinite amount of is time. And, um, you know, it's like 11 years. I'm 11 years again. I wish I did it in five. Wow. Right. I mean, I mean, look at Afterpay. Afterpay has exited $39 billion <laughs> oh, so after six, six, six years, right? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, phenomenal. Six years. Right. And, you know, I'm here 11 years in. Right. So, you know, like, um, you just wish you could do things quicker. Yeah. Um, You're doing pretty well, yeah, Matt. That's good advice. Though. <laughs> it's, yeah. always, it's always you don't know what you don't know. And then if you do it all over again, you can, I'm sure you can do it in a third of the time. Yeah. Yeah, you can. You can. I mean, it's all a trade off, right? I mean, you've got, you've got a, you've got a um, bunch of parameters you've got to fit within, right? So the question is, do you want to do, do it in a profitable way? Right. And not go, not go deeply cash flow negative. Therefore, you've got constraints how much money you can spend. You know, um, and then you've got also the time constraints of, well, how quick can you do it? Yeah, if I spend more money, maybe I can do it a bit quicker, provided I know what I'm telling people to do. You want to make sure that everyone's working on something productive. Every dollar you spend, you're making more than a dollar back. And yeah. you don't have people kind of sitting around doing their thumbs. And if you do scale up too quickly, and you hire a lot of people quickly, you, you won't have a perfect management team. And so you will have lots of people sitting around that are not productive, that are do- that, that they, might be, they might be doing a lot of stuff, but that stuff isn't actually doing anything for the business. It's just churning you know churning time yeah. right so well Matt mate yeah. thanks for your time that was very very insightful today so thank you for that mate yeah Appreciate and it. massive congratulations yeah. on all your success no problem it's exciting I'm looking forward to seeing the next spaceship that goes up <laughs> and we'll know that's, that was built by a freelancer well the arm rail yeah. the, the handrail <laughs> <laughs> okay long way to go yeah thanks for talking to you guys thanks Matt cheers thanks, mate Matt. See ya.